Hi everyone, I'm Emma Eggleston, the Dean here at the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Division. Welcome to November's Mini Med School. Tonight's topic is on strategies for coping with the emotional and mental health impacts of COVID-19. As we all know, the individual and societal impact of the continuing pandemic has been tremendous, and many of us are feeling the emotional and mental health challenges that come with that. We're fortunate to have two of our behavioral health leads, Dr. Stephanie McGraw and Dr. Michael Angrobanez, to share some of their tips and approaches for managing this, the stress and maintaining connection with your own health and your friends and family members. So Dr. McGraw uh, is one of our psychology faculty members and she's also the training director for our doctoral intern program. Dr. Angrobanez is our chief of psychiatry. Both Dr. McGraw and Dr. Angrobanez have been tremendously helpful for our own health system in helping us tackle our stress and burnout in facing this pandemic. I'm very hopeful that you will find their guidance as helpful as we have. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening regarding a very important topic about coping with COVID-19. Again, I'm Dr. Michael Angrobanis and I have Dr. Stephanie McGraw with us. And we're gonna be talking about a lot of important facts and strategies on how to deal with this very challenging topic and adapting to our new way of living. Hopefully, hopefully soon this will start resolving, but nonetheless, we're here to help and we're here to provide some options for you and ways to cope and strategize on how to get better and also in ways to seek out help and things to look out for in terms of if you are feeling COVID burnout or feeling sick or feeling that you need to see a professional. So we shall begin right now. Thank you. To get us started, we wanted to just take a moment and check in. How's everyone coping now that we're many months into this pandemic? I know that my levels of stress and what we'll refer to in this presentation as COVID fatigue comes and goes. This past week, it's been kind of rough. We had a couple of scares close to my family. And so I noticed that some of those anxieties start to rise, whereas maybe they had been dying down for a little while as we were coming off of summer and enjoying some of the weather. I wonder, Dr. Eng, how have things been going for you? Yeah, same with myself. Uh, we've had several scares in our family uh, several months ago. And again, despite, you know, quarantining at home, mm -hmm. There are still a lot of risks that are out there. We don't want to use any scare tactics or, or make anybody feel more anxious, but it is very important to be reasonable in terms of protecting yourselves and protecting your family, but also managing your mental health by doing things that are not very restrictive, but things that will help you sort of cope. And that's what we're gonna be going over, but certainly uh, both Dr. McGraw and myself had had our close run-ins and again, working in the mental health field, we, we often see many patients in person, mm -hmm. and that can be also a risk for our patients and for ourselves. So it's, it's just uh, to the utmost importance that we need to be uh, protecting ourselves and each other uh, from this disease and being mindful and reasonable in how we approach it. Mm -hmm. To help have these conversations, we've included what we refer to in the behavioral health community as a SUDS rating. When you're talking to your friends, your family, important others about how you're doing, it can be helpful to dig into a little bit of the numbers. And if we think of how our emotional health is, is on a scale from zero to no distress, I'm totally relaxed in this moment, all the way up to 100, highest anxiety or distress that you've ever felt. As we're thinking about where we are in coping with all of the stressors associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, Anchoring some of your emotions can be a helpful strategy. So let's think a little bit about what's working, what isn't working as we move forward into winter. I know that for my family, being able to get out and enjoy the summer, the weather, the warm weather, going on hikes and walks, that was so wonderful. In those moments, things really kind of felt like normal. As we gear up for winter, I know that we've hit daylight savings. I know that the sun's going down earlier. I know that it's colder outside and I'm not getting the kids outside to push them on the swing as much as I was a couple of weeks ago. 
all of these things I can feel are starting to build up and create a toll. Um, I'd like to reiterate what Dr. McGraw was saying. And a lot of the patients that I'm, I'm getting is, is, a lot of the patients that I see oftentimes talk about the limitations they have in terms of exploring other avenues of feeling like they have freedoms to do things. And one of those things is getting outside, wearing masks and being in crowds. So as I had mentioned before, one of the most important things that I would like to reiterate is the importance of being reasonable. No one's telling you that you have to confine yourself at home, isolated without any connections to the outside world. In fact, we'll later touch on that later in the um, presentation, but it's about connecting with others, whether it be digitally or through the phone, um, or just going out for walks with a loved one, someone that you've, you've been quarantined with, and in fact, enjoying whatever weather is left for the fall and still being able to feel connected to someone because I think that's very important mm -hmm. uh, in terms of coping with what we're dealing with right now. Awesome. So to go over our outline for tonight, we are going to start by talking a little bit about the symptoms of COVID fatigue. And then we're going to touch on a number of different areas that we believe can significantly improve one's mental health and coping as we gear up for winter. You want to lead us away? Yeah, sure. So symptom wise, a lot of these symptoms coincide with, with depression, with anxiety, and also other disorders that are, that are certainly important to manage. And some of these symptoms include not feeling like yourself, feelings of sadness, fearfulness, emptiness, also hopelessness, worthlessness, and guilt, trouble doing things that you need to do that you previously wanted to do. Oftentimes we find that when we feel depressed or sad, we feel unmotivated, and we also lose interest in the things that we used to like doing. And if you find that's happening, that is something to be very mindful of and something that you definitely want to talk to your doctor about or your family members or someone close to that you trust. Uh, other symptoms include uh, any strong emotion that interferes with your daily functioning, emotions that feel all-consuming or result in impulsive displays of irritability, um, isolating, like I said, from important others, changes in your sleep or appetite. That's also very important. We want to make sure that we're getting enough rest and that we're eating well. We're going to go further into detail regarding those topics, but if you're not taking care of your physical health, your mental health suffers and vice versa. So there's a there's really a continuum in terms of how well you're doing and making sure that you address all these various parts of your, your health in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle during this time. Um, I think we can move forward with that. So let's talk about sleep and the importance of sleep. Sleep is one of the most essential means of being healthy and being happy. And oftentimes, particularly during this time, a lot of people's sleep schedules are off because whether there's changes in work, God forbid if you've lost employment, or if you've had your kids working, for, you know, kids doing schooling from home, our sleep schedules are off. So it's really important to pay attention to how we are utilizing our sleep hygiene and some tips that we definitely want to impress upon you include setting the stage for a quiet, dark, and cool place. You want to make sure that the environment you're sleeping in is cool, comfortable, quiet. We also want to make sure that we strive for consistency in terms of the times of days, that, uh, the time of night that you're sleeping, and that it's consistent. So your body gets attuned to those times and that you can start sleeping more comfortably and it becomes easier. Um, you want to avoid taking too long of naps during a day. So scientifically, we understand that taking that sleeping too long can actually be this, you know, can be uh, a disadvantage to us because we can sleep. And then at that point, if we go beyond maybe eight to nine hours, we start to feel more lethargic, tired, fatigued. So usually the sweet spot for rest is between seven to eight hours. And oftentimes the sweet spot for napping is usually between 20 to 40 minutes. Anything beyond that, you're going to start reaching certain sleep cycles that can actually counteract your productivity throughout the day in terms of your cognition and your ability to focus and, 
and be able to perform activities. Uh, other things you want to do is limit activities in your bed to just sleep and sex. You don't want to be gaming in bed. You don't want to be watching movies for three hours in bed because you're activating your brain. The blue lights and all the, the, the stimulation is activating your brain. So it's going to be very hard for you to turn off your mind while you're trying to sleep. You know, I think this is one of the hardest things that I've heard from people as they've adjusted to much more work from home. Mm -hmm, that's that right. whereas we would be out in the office doing things during the day, now mm -hmm. people are forced to make makeshift home offices and sometimes working in their bedrooms or even in bed. That's and right. so the more things you do in that space, the more confused your brain's going to be when it comes time to actually fall asleep. So true. trying to limit as much as possible the activities you do in bed and in your bedroom, that will help you when it comes time to fall asleep at night. Absolutely. And going back to the stimulation, watching TV or being stimulated while you're in bed is very, uh, it can be very uh, damaging to your ability to get a restful night because your brain is still activated and you're not, be, you're not being able to tune it down, to slow it down back to speed limit and you're, you'll be thinking about things and trying to go to bed you'll be having all these things through your mind racing thoughts thinking about today what had happened through the day and are worrying about the next day so we want to make sure that we are tuning the brain down as to get as to prepare it for sleep um, so again watching tv is something that we wouldn't recommend listening to podcasts listening to things that are more relaxing more meditative uh, even prayer those types of things are are supposed to you know activate your your parasympathetic nervous system help you relax slow your heart rate down slow your breathing down and help you overall just get a better night's rest and a quicker rest uh, another very important topic is exercise we need to make sure that we're exercising or doing some type of activity now this goes with a lot of things if we want to go outside we certainly need vitamin d we certain certainly need the sun in fact a high percentage of of people in the United States, particularly in West Virginia, suffer from vitamin D deficiency. So actively getting sunlight, even for 15 minutes, it's shown that just getting 15 minutes of natural sunlight resets your sleep cycle and will help you sleep, fall asleep faster and fall asleep better. So getting sunlight and exercising, we want to make sure that we are active we're getting the blood pumping in your body and you're you're having a lot of oxygen to your brain and that you're getting all the nutrients you need in terms of eating right and eating healthy and then activating those muscles and and also getting rid of those toxins that are building up in your system so no one's telling you to run a marathon no one's telling you to become a prized weightlifter but just those certain activities are not only healthy for your body and for your mind but also prime you for sleep so make sure that we are able to do that as long as you have you know you're relatively in good health and you have a uh, you communicate closely with your doctor in regards to whatever type of exercise activity you want to perform um, next we'll be talking about the bedtime routine uh, again having consistency in a routine is very important showering before bed a warm shower is also very relaxing before you go to bed taking a bath putting on some nice scented lotion brushing your teeth, making sure that your hygiene is well. And again, meditation and prayer, all those things prep you for sleep and maintaining that consistency will help you just have a schedule and help you fall asleep better. And again, I had mentioned uh, relaxation exercises, guided imagery, visual, visualization, deep breathing. I don't know if you have any other uh, strategies on in terms of relaxation. Let's actually loop back around to that when we talk a little bit about mindful meditation in a few slides. Okay. So let's continue with some, um, some more tips. Uh, avoid stimulants. Now this is also something very important and difficult to do during these times, but uh, we have a lot of people who love to drink coffee, a lot of people who love to drink soda. And now is the perfect time to address that and to, to start cutting back on your caffeine intake. Now usually there are several studies that show that drinking more, about three to, to six cups of coffee a day are actually cardioprotective. But I'm, I'm saying in this, in this talk and in this lecture regarding sleep hygiene, it's important to cut back on your caffeine because if you drink anything, usually after, let's say 3 p.m., you'll still be activated and anything after six, certainly you'll be activated. Uh, now, 
Now, caffeine does come in with withdrawal, so it's, it's very important to be mindful of how much you're drinking and the rate at which you're decreasing your amount of caffeine. But ultimately, in order to get a good rest, caffeine is something that we don't want in the equation, as well as heavy sugars uh, that can cause a decreased sleep and also weight gain. You can put yourself more at risk for diabetes. And other things to avoid are nicotine and cigarettes. Now's the perfect time to quit. It's easier said than done. But again, talking to your doctor, to your family, family practitioner, nurse practitioner, to your psychiatrist or even psychologist, we can all sort of help patients now sort of kick this habit. It's a perfect and opportune time to do this, again, for healthy sleep and also for just overall mental health. Nicotine and caffeine are both substances that are very well known globally to cause altered uh, states in terms of your mood emotionally and physically. They raise your heart rate, they raise your blood pressure, and they can lead to irritability, they can lead to anger and mood swings. And already on patients who are vulnerable to mental illnesses, these things can only exacerbate those symptoms. So it's not just avoid these chemicals purely for sleep, but it's also good to limit and use them reasonably, particularly the caffeine. We know that the dangers of nicotine I don't, this, this is not a nicotine talk, but we, we know that stopping nicotine in general adds years to your life. But again, these, these things and limiting them and limiting their use will be very healthy for you, not only for your hygiene, for sleep, but also for your mental health and your life as a whole. Uh, avoid significant alcohol consumption. So the misconception here is that using alcohol actually makes you sleep better. It certainly will make you tired and will certainly make you drowsy, but it doesn't help with your with the completeness of your sleep. There are three, three main stages of sleep and oftentimes using alcohol, we don't get a restful night of sleep. Hence, when we wake up in the morning, you feel tired, you feel fatigued. So using alcohol as, a, as an intermittent sedative to help you go to sleep is not a good idea. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and it, it does affect the quality and the, the length of your sleep. So avoid using alcohol. Don't look at the, the clock. You know, that's, that's something that's very easily said than done. Uh, oftentimes, we, when we wake up, we'll look at the clock to our right, and if we're not getting any sleep, we're going to continue to just uh, ruminate and think about how much time is passing and how much time we're wasting, mm -hmm. when in fact, if you're not sleepy, the advice is to just get up out of bed, do something a little bit more relaxing, have a little snack, and then try to reset your mind and your your, 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 phys your physical being to go back to bed and sleep. And it's not really gonna be beneficial to sit there and stare at your clock. So we would advise you, if you know that you're awake and then you're ruminating over this, don't look at your clock, just get up, reset, and then go back to bed when you feel a little bit more tired. I like the reframe personally. Uh, this is my time for relaxation. I don't need to be asleep in order to relax. I just need to mm -hmm. relax. This is my time for relaxation. When I notice kind of those clock watching ideas or mm -hmm. kind of running, my thoughts running away from me and saying, gosh, Stephanie, you need to go to sleep right now. Don't you know mm -hmm. how early you have to get up in the morning? Reset, this is my time for relaxation. I don't need to be asleep in order to be relaxed. Absolutely. So those are the two, the two following topics we talked about, take control of your thoughts and getting out of bed. So we'll move next to hydration. And we're talking about water here. And again, really water, is water that important to our system? It certainly is. Um, just to, to, to uh, reiterate some very important facts is that as many as 67% of Americans are dehydrated on, any, dehydrated on any given day. So dehydration increases in winter due to cold, dry air, and symptoms can mimic that of depression mm -hmm. and that of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome yes. and that of anxiety, cause fatigue, mood swings, hunger, achy joints, dark urine, constipation, impairment in attention and memory. Now, going back to what I had just talked about, alcohol and caffeine and nicotine can exacerbate dehydration. So again, avoiding those, those chemicals and hydrating and just drinking pure water would be uh, the more fruitful and, and mindful approach to addressing your health. To reiterate, symptoms of dehydration include fatigue, mood swings, hunger, achy joints, dark urine, constipation, impairments of attention and memory. So remember that it's key to hydrate yourself as to avoid these, these symptoms. 
So are we really talking about water? We sure are. So we recommend that you drink one gallon of water per day. That's 128 fluid ounces. And strategies could include behaviorally anchoring your goal, setting smart goals, invest in a reusable water bottle, set short-term goals to track throughout the day, set reminders on your phone, buy a water dispenser, and put it near your TV or desk to increase access, or add flavorings to mix it up. Sometimes it's hard to just drink water. I, I know there's a lot of water substitutes and, and flavored waters that, that are still exciting and fun to drink. So just put that in your mix and just remember to hydrate reasonably. Besides water, another important thing is diet. We have to make sure that we're eating well. We need to limit mindless and emotional eating. Again, we have more time at home. The fridge is right next to our offices. Uh, when we're bored, when we're watching TV, it's very easy to just open that fridge and start eating whatever we want. It's, it goes back to setting limitations and setting consistency as to what time you're gonna eat and the amount of food you're gonna eat in terms of counting your calories so that you don't find yourself gaining weight, you don't find yourself putting yourself more at risk for diabetes, hypertension, and other metabolic disorders. We wanna eat five regular meals scheduled daily. Create a food journal and document the times that you are hungry, the level of hunger and the food that you have been consuming and the thoughts and emotions you have when consuming these foods. Make sure to face your stuff and don't stuff your face. So again, be reasonable and understand what you're eating and make sure that you're not just doing it to comfort yourself emotionally because there are so many other healthy avenues that we can approach to meet our emotional needs rather than just eating. And that's gonna be a very important topic to avoid those health risks. Uh, limit access to high risk foods, sugary foods, fatty foods, drink water like we had said, and practice mindful eating. So what we've been talking about so far is really creating the foundation for a healthy lifestyle to really help us weather the storm in the coming months. Another area associated with that is physical exercise. Now, if we think about it, physical exercise has been challenging for some, especially as the gyms have shut down in many areas, many continue to be shut down. So we've had to get really creative. Having the benefit of the summer and the warm weather made it nice, made it easier to get outside. But it doesn't mean that exercise is any less crucial as we're gearing up for December, January, February, our coldest months in this area. What we recommend here is using a five point system to really help strategize our approach to exercise. First, finding something that excites you. It doesn't have to be going and, and pumping iron. If taking your kids outside for a walk helps, if going to the CNO Canal and riding your bike helps, do those things. If you're able to, if you're, if you're a reader and you really get into a, a podcast or a book, reward yourself, listen to that book while you go for a walk or if you're fortunate enough to have some home exercise equipment, link a, a TV show. I mean, I am a big fan of The Bachelorette. It's an intense season. <laughs> so I watch it while I'm on the elliptical at night. And that is how I limit my access to that TV, but also doing it in an activity that helps me exercise. If I may, one thing that's commonly overlooked with exercise mm -hmm. is yoga. Yes. Yoga can provide a lot of relaxation techniques in the midst of getting your stretches in mm -hmm. and also strengthening your muscles, yeah. improving flexibility, mindfulness, and also just meditative uh, practices. So there are so many videos on YouTube and mm -hmm. also on, uh, on other uh, media platforms that just do basic tutorials of yoga. I love that idea yeah. because yoga is really one of those exercises that can be for all body types, yeah. including seated yoga. Mm -hmm. So let's say that we have some mobility impairments or we're more stiff. Mm -hmm. Doing exercises, doing stretches from a seated position is mm -hmm. so helpful as well. So really something that can get you pumped, something that gets you excited, something that is also gonna be easy to start, okay. that we wanna set realistic goals. So I'm not saying you need to exercise for an hour, seven days a week. That's not what we're talking about. If what you can commit to is five minutes once a week right now, well, 
That's five minutes more than you were doing last week. That's right. Set a reasonable and attainable goal and find ways to build exercise into your routine. So for example, we do the things that we prioritize, that people are much less likely to miss a scheduled doctor's appointment than they are to miss scheduled time for self-care because that doctor's appointment gets made in the calendar, that you have reminders built into your day to go. I'm saying protect the space for exercise and for yourself the same way you would for any medical appointment. It's really a commitment that you're making to yourself. Absolutely. Next, really find ways to make it social. So one of those things that can motivate you, let's say you go and do your, your 15 minutes of walking and you call someone on the phone and they're walking at the same time or you find a way to reward one another and cheer one another on as you're engaging in these activities. Lastly, the reward yourself. Preferably we would not reward with food, <laughs> although if that's where you are right now, hey, reward with food. But if there are ways that you can be kind to yourself either with a desired activity like a television show or maybe you get your, your family, your partner involved and you get a nice back massage when you're done. Things that you find that will help you just push yourself over that edge and commit to action. That's really what we're talking about here. Absolutely. Moving forward, so related to exercise, but we're also talking here about activity scheduling. So what I mean here is using activity scheduling as a means of self-care. So what is self-care? Self-care is the practice of taking action to preserve or improve our own health. That wh why do we bother with self-care? Self-care are the things that we need to do to recharge and re-energize ourselves. When, when we're driving, and, well, for me at least, it always seems like I'm running late. And then my gas light comes on and I am faced with an impossible decision that drives my husband absolutely crazy. Do I keep going where I'm supposed to go and risk the gas fate? Or do I stop and take time and delay my arrival by another couple of minutes? Well, typically I, I kind of push it as far as I can. But <laughs> what happens is eventually we have to stop because otherwise the car's not gonna go anymore. The same thing is true with us and our, own, our mental health, that we can go and we can go and we can go and we can hold only so much emotional or cognitive strain before we just break down. And really, in so many ways, that's where so many of us are getting now in the midst of this pandemic. That yes, there was a lot of really hard things last March, April, May, June, and the cumulative effect of that becomes even harder. If we're to take, for example, this pen, and I ask you to hold it out in front of you, mm -hmm. how heavy is that? It's very light. It's very light, right? Mm -hmm. If I ask you to hold that pen out for an hour, or a day, or a week, or a month, or throughout the rest of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's gonna be very heavy. It's going to be incredibly heavy, yeah. not because the weight of the pen changes, but because the cumulative toll the cumulative fatigue sets in and our muscles need a break. Our bodies need a break. And that's why self-care becomes so incredibly crucial. There's so many different types of self-care. So we have a list here to choose from, but these by no means are an exhaustive list. We're talking about finding ways to relax, to distract movement and play. The list goes on and on and on. But in order to make these things work, we need to be scheduling these activities. We need to make a commitment to ourselves that this is what we're going to do and we are gonna protect that space and we're gonna protect that time regardless of what other stressors or challenges come in our way. That this can take many forms. It can take the form of choosing one or two activities that you're gonna do the very next day and that becomes your goal. It can also take a more intense form like this where you schedule out times in a planner and you literally schedule your day for the next day. Carving out time for your trashy TV or your books or your exercise, just like you would carve out time for meetings or doctor's appointments. So if I can interrupt, I, I completely agree with you on that. And I love the analogy about burning out gas. Mm -hmm. We all have a gas tank. Yes. And then if we continue to run our engines at 100 miles per hour, we're gonna burn out quick. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we damage we simply damage our engines. So it's very important to be mindful of how much gas you're using and to making sure that you, you use that gas 
mindfully and creatively, but also not overuse it. There's times you use your gas for work, but there's also time you use for your family, and there's also times you use your gas for yourself. And that's what we're talking about in terms of self-care. And very important piece of this is to schedule things out because we can get so busy and overwhelmed with our, our current day, whether it's with family or with work, that we don't have that time to schedule. I'm telling you now it's very important, and as Dr. McGraw had said, it's very important to carve out those pieces of time, whether it's going to the beach with your loved one or going to, uh, you know, just for a drive or going to a winery or something just to spend quality time with family members and making sure that you have that piece carved out for you. Because if you don't and you don't plan that, oftentimes we'll just miss out on that opportunity and you'll just continue to, uh, to work and, and burn out that engine. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that the shift to, to work from home throughout this pandemic has limited our ability to engage in that self-care mm -hmm. more so than we've ever realized. That for some people, seeing another person and giving a social smile or saying hello to a stranger while you're doing your weekly grocery shopping, that that, that was filling up their gas tank, That's that that right. was something. Mm -hmm. For other people, it was driving into work or driving home from work and listening to a podcast or an audiobook or the radio and just decompressing as that safety. That now that so many people are working from home, there are not these boundaries right. where we were able to protect even five, 10, 15 minutes for self-care a couple of times a day, even if we weren't calling it that or didn't realize that that's what we were doing we are now feeling the weight of not having that time. Mm -hmm. And so I love those ideas, getting out, even if it is, hey, you know what? I need to find a way to signal the end of my work day. So I'm gonna go and get in my car and I'm gonna drive around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Do it completely distant in my car. I'm not gonna interact with anybody, but I'm gonna go and I'm gonna listen to the radio and I'm just gonna take a drive and enjoy that mental place to decompress. Mm -hmm. A couple of other COVID friendly self-care activities for winter. As Dr. Ang was saying earlier, we need to get natural sunlight every day. That so many people, especially in this area, have a vitamin D deficiency. There are others who have a seasonal component to, to their major depressive disorders where their mood becomes much worse in the winter. Finding ways to get that natural sunlight, even if it's 15 minutes a day, can be absolutely life-changing. Other ideas include therapy lights, have been shown to have a protective and healing factor for individuals who are vitamin D deficient. And so looking into those resources, indoor, outdoor, but planning your day so that you can find time for this. Even if that means getting up early and opening the blinds, just get the sunlight in while it is around us. Another idea is finding some COVID safe hobbies. So do the thing that you've been putting off. Join the book club, set 15 minutes aside a day to read. Finally beat Zelda Breath of the Wild. I know that's still on my list. <laughs> Sign up for virtual yoga classes or videos, knit, crochet, plan a vacation, or learn a new recipe. Do the thing that you've wanted to do that there was always a reason not to do. And part of that could be starting a journal writing down maybe what's going on in your life, or maybe you t make a gratitude journal piece, write down one or three good things that happened that day or the day before. Your brain is going to find what it's looking for. So if you're shining a flashlight looking on all of the reasons why this pandemic is awful and the winter is going to be worse, you will find those reasons. That's right. If you choose to look for the good, you will find the good. That one of my best friends likes to remind me that during crises, during moments of struggle, look for the helpers. You will find them. And there's a lot of beauty in that. Also, what I would like to uh, remind everyone out there is that there are activities that Dr. McGraw's mentioning here, and these are all active activities. And that's very important to be active, to stimulate your brain and stimulate your body. Remember that we can, we can still have activities to relax, but watching TV for eight hours is not going to be something that would be necessarily healthy for you because number one, you're maintaining this state of uh, inactivity and you're not actively engaging your mind or your brain. So picking up these hobbies, uh, learning how to grow plants in a garden or getting a fish tank and attending to fishes, all these things are more activating for your brain 
and can be more fulfilling. And, and just sort of sitting there and watching TV or being passive is not necessarily uh, cultivating your creativity, nor is it really helping with your cognition and your abilities to focus and, and focus on, on positive things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as important as it is to focus on what you're doing, focusing on what you're not doing. Mm -hmm. So decluttering your electronics. Maybe that means taking a day and deleting social media from, from your phone so you don't have as much access. Or unfollow social media accounts that aren't bringing you joy or happiness. But being deliberate about the input of information that you're getting and choosing that strategically to help match the mood that you would like. Moving forward, I want to talk about another really important self-care strategy that's called mindful meditation. So mindfulness, it's a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting all of one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations without judgment or criticism. Mindful meditation is an incredibly useful tool if we're trying to move ourselves into what we call wise mind. Wise mind is the con interaction between one's emotional mind, our feelings, and our logical mind, our thoughts. As you might realize that as one's emotional volume increases, the intensity of one's emotions increase, our ability to think clearly really decreases. The mm -hmm. two are inversely related. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to hold them both in equal footing so that in that in-between, we can find our inner wisdom. Mindful meditation slowing down helps us do this. How we might do that, what we're doing. So what we're doing when we're meditating is we are observing our senses. We're observing what's going on around us. We're describing and putting words to those experiences and we're participating. We are throwing ourselves into the exercise, into the activity. We are fully engaging. How are we doing this? We're doing it non-judgmentally. So as long as you're showing up and you're trying, you're not doing it wrong. If you, in a two minute mindfulness practice, get distracted 100 times and you refocus yourself 101 times, that is still a success. There's not a way to do this wrong. Because we're coming at this together, we're coming at it one mindfully and really just connecting to that present moment as effectively as possible. To help us with this, we have some apps. So these are some screenshots of one, one of those apps. This is a free app that you can get on Apple and Android devices called Stop, Breathe, Think. And so what I love about this app is it walks you through doing the self-check, where you're checking in physically, you're checking in mentally, and then you can add up to five emotions that you might be experiencing. It will calculate those emotions based on its internal algorithm and come up with some different mindfulness exercises based on what you're feeling in that moment. It's really cool. So you see that there's lots of great resources or, or topics as well. If we're, trouble, we're having trouble with sleep, you can click on the sleep well exercises and really just explore and experiment with it. Another application that can be really helpful as we're thinking about these different interventions is this is the COVID coach. And what I love about this is there's just so many different ways to use the application if we want to manage stress, if we want to learn more about behavioral principles, if we want to check in and track our mood over this period of time, or we really need to help troubleshoot one of these challenges that we're experiencing. There's a wealth of resources here, as long, uh, along with daily reminders of things that you can be doing to help yourself engage in that regular self-care. So our last topic for tonight is really, I'd say, the most important. Here we're talking about outreach, we're talking about connection, other people. We know that during times of stress and distress, we are hardwired for connection. We never outgrow our need to turn to other people when we're feeling overwhelmed. And now we're in a time in, in this world's history where doing that isn't safe in the ways that it always has been. And so we have to get creative and think about what we can do to still meet those innate human needs, those very real needs while we're also keeping ourselves and the people we care about as safe as possible. Strategies for this. Spend quality time with the people you live with. And I think here I'm, I'm talking about get away from the TV, right? Sitting next to each other on the couch watching TV isn't an activity that you're really doing together. It is more of a passive way to be with someone. And here we're talking about find ways to actively engage. 
So for example, when you go and play fetch with your dog, you're not focusing on the ball. You're focusing on the dog. When you watch TV with a loved one, you're not focusing on your loved one. <laughs> you're focusing on the TV. <laughs> Let's find ways to focus on one another. Maybe that is preparing a meal together, or maybe that is breaking out the Monopoly or, or the card games, but finding ways to turn towards instead of away from one another. We also have the benefit of technology. So if this pandemic were happening back in the early 80s, I can't imagine the psychological drain that we'd be experiencing then because we wouldn't have as easy access to cell phones, video calls, the internet, other means of connection. Let's take advantage of that technology in helpful ways. Make the call, send the text, get out there. Even if you, you know, look at this as an opportunity to text a family member that you haven't texted or a friend that you haven't reached out to in a while and just send them a positive, upbeat, I'm thinking of you text. Set a goal of trying to talk to one new person a day. You don't have any idea the powerful impact that could have, not just on your own well-being, but on theirs as well. And, and again, the, the impression here and the, the, the message is that you can utilize the internet and you can u utilize uh, your computer to communicate. But again, it, it, it can be a vice as well, just like watching TV. It can be something extremely passive and not to knock on all the video game players out there or the people who just use social media or just watch YouTube. Those are things that we do to relax and to pass time. But again, you do it reasonably. You don't let it consume your entire day because you're gonna find that con consistently doing those passive types of activities will in fact distance you from your loved ones, especially if you have people who live with you or you need to make a call to your mother who lives in another state or in another country, as for myself and actively calling the family member or utilizing the Zoom um, and also other means of communication and actively using the technology that we have to connect. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. And like everything else, trying to set some consistency with this. Mm -hmm. So I love the idea of, I have a friend who on Friday nights does virtual happy hours. And so yeah. after work, she'll get her glass of wine and she will video um, conference with friends that she hasn't talked to and she goes through a cycle. So she's making her rounds and connecting with people that she otherwise wouldn't have had an opportunity to connect with mm -hmm. while she's also engaging in a relaxation exercise to really help consistently usher in her weekend. We're finding ways to remind ourselves and one another that we are together in this. As we're gearing up for the holidays, I would encourage everyone to plan ahead. That this holiday season is unlikely to look like the holiday seasons that you're used to. That doesn't mean that there is not going to be opportunity for good times or connection, but it is going to require additional planning. Specifically, I recommend discussing with family members in advance what the plans are and what are the rules and expectations. So for example, are all family members going to receive a COVID test beforehand? Are we going to wear masks? What are the rules about touching or hugging? Having these conversations and understanding what to expect ahead of time is going to set yourselves up for success when those days come, and it will help avoid feelings of discomfort or, Awkward, or awkwardness, awkwardness, really. Awkwardness, yeah. yeah, so that if something happens because we're excited and being close together and seeing one another, hey, we might need to fall back on the plans that we had discussed. And so if you have had those discussions, it can be much easier to say, hey, you know, I would love to give you a hug, but as we discussed before, it's just not safe to do that, that that's not what we're doing here. So finding ways to, to think ahead and, and discuss these plans. And maybe that means that you're not gonna get together with loved ones in the way that you have in the past, but are there other ways that you can show your love and connection? So for example, writing cards, handwriting letters to loved ones, baking Christmas cookies or holiday treats and sending them off and leaving them at, at people's doors. That's right finding ways to engage and connect, even if we can't do it by occupying the same space. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I guess really it comes down to giving yourself permission to, to write new traditions. And it might feel different, but doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. 
Adapting to new traditions doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. It could actually be something that's really good and you choose to carry forward into years to come. Lastly, we want to wrap up with some online resources. So we can't cover all topics related to one's mental health and coping within the short period of time. But we do want to direct everyone to some helpful resources online, including Coping with COVID through WVU Medicine, for parents helping children cope with COVID. We also are including resources for the National Suicide Prevention Line and their website, and also the Disaster Distress Helpline, text line, or their website. We hope you all stay safe, protect yourselves, protect your loved ones, and protect your mental health. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening.